Hello, my name is Don Wasserman, and I was NIOSH's first chief of occupational vibration way back in 1971. I would like to introduce to you the medical aspects of hand arm vibration syndrome. But before doing so, I'd like to briefly give you a little bit of information that you may not be able to get elsewhere. This disease started in 1918, it was recognized in 1918, the first occupationally by Dr. Alice Hamilton, an occupational physician, and she studied a group of workers in Bedford, Indiana. It was first recognized and published in 1918. As a result, okay, the literature has been filled with numerous articles about other people who are exposed to hand arm vibration syndrome. Then it was called Raynaud's phenomenon of occupational origin. Today it is called hand-arm vibration syndrome. In this tape that we are introducing, you will learn how to recognize the symptoms of hand-arm vibration syndrome and how doctors are advised to actually help in diagnosis and treatment of same. When we did, we being NIOSH, did our studies in the early 1980s, we had to have a way to communicate with the public our findings. And we did so by producing this first NIOSH tape in the early 1980s and 1990s. What we have chosen to do in this particular tape is to extract the most salient aspects of the original tape and then fill you in on the latest developments since the time when the tape was originally shot. Okay, so without further ado, we're going to first start with the introduction to hand arm vibration. Shipbuilding, mining, construction, foundry, and forestry work are some of the occupations where the use of handheld vibrating tools is a vital part of the job. The force generated for work by these tools can be very high, but part of that energy is transmitted to the operator where it can cause painful disorders in the hands and upper limbs. These conditions are referred to collectively as hand-arm vibration syndrome. Smaller tools that vibrate may be just as damaging as large ones. The exposed worker may experience effects ranging from occasional discomfort from cold to more serious effects such as tingling and numbness that do not go away, finger blanching and pain. Frequently, victims have trouble sensing objects and textures with their fingertips. The problem is progressive. In later stages, it may lead to loss of dexterity of the fingers. It's important that you understand that hand-arm vibration syndrome is a cold-dependent condition. That does not mean that people who live in Florida or warm climates do not get the disease problem but it does mean that cold tends to trigger the attacks. If you smoke, the nicotine tends, tends to uh, make things worse as well, but it is absolutely a cold dependent condition and that and vibration trigger the attacks and create the various attacks as you go. We're gonna introduce Dr. Martin Cherniak, now of the University of Connecticut, who has examined many, many patients who will describe the symptomology to you with regard to temperature. White finger. And again, what people frequently describe is their fingers turning white in the cold and being quite painful. Uh, these uh, episodes usually occurring, uh, although not in all cases, in discrete attacks uh, where uh, uh, frequently on first exposure to cold in the morning when they leave the home and then again on tool use, uh, uh, fingers will turn white. Uh, uh, progressively, uh, there's almost a kind of working down the finger from uh, distal to proximal. Um, and uh, these will generally respond to, uh, to rewarming, but again, the severity and the frequency seems to increase over time. The next segment I'd like you to pay particular attention to. It is a bit old, but it's a foundry worker who's totally unscripted, and the information he gives you is as true today as it was when we shot this some years ago. This is the classic worker who is feeling the pain and suffering from HAVS on a daily 
basis. I worked in the foundry approximately 15 years and I started out as a chipper and a grinder and uh, as chipping and grinding from running the grinder and chipper my hands would start tingling and then numbing filling and it would take a few hours after the eight hour shift for my hands to come back to normal. I chipped and grinded for approximately eight years and then I been on a core maker's job and I made cores for around three years and then my fingers, index finger went numb, it started tingling and it ulcerated and they turned white and after that I couldn't uh, run any vibrating tools anymore so I took a lower paying job as a material handler and it uh, interfered with uh, a lot of my uh, activities at home, like even sports like fishing, hunting in the winter. I can't get out when the temperature drops. My fingers would be painful and turn white. It's very important worldwide that physicians diagnose these cases and classify the extent of the disease process in such a way that physicians all over the world understand exactly where a given patient is along the spectrum, this disease spectrum. This is called staging. It was developed by two British physicians who are no longer with us but are very famous, Dr. William Taylor and Dr. Peter Palmier. What you will see next is what are called the staging processes starting from minimum severity to maximum severity. It turns out that the original staging was insufficient and so a new staging called the Stockholm scale was added to the staging process. It's important that you please pay particular attention to the staging process. In the early 1970s, doctors William Taylor and Peter Palmier were working together in the United Kingdom on the white finger problem. After examining many workers suffering from the use of vibrating tools, they developed a scale to classify the extent of a worker's illness. The first stages involved symptoms of tingling and numbness in one or more fingers. With continued exposure to vibration, the symptoms advanced to include whitening of one or more fingers. If the insult to the body persisted, leaving the job was a later stage. In the most severe cases, which rarely happen, gangrene may occur. This classification system has served both the medical and scientific communities for many years. In the mid-1980s, after a number of physicians had reported seeing numerous patients who did not progress beyond the symptoms of numbness or tingling, in spite of continued use of vibrating tools, the Stockholm classification system emerged. Now doctors assess the damage to both the neurological system and to the blood vessel or vascular system in each hand separately, so that at each assessment, four different grades or classifications are given. For an accurate diagnosis, a doctor must have information about previous tool use and whether symptoms occurred before or after first vibration exposure. An up-to-date occupational history is essential. Lacerations and fractures are common in these tool users these trauma often affect digit circulation, so a doctor's examination of the fingers is advisable. Hypertension, arteriosclerosis, diabetes, arthritic conditions, and collagen diseases interfere with circulation and must also be excluded as causes of the symptoms. There are other conditions that may confuse a doctor's diagnosis. They must be systematically eliminated. You may be wondering how the staging is arrived at. There, are, there is an entire diagnostic package that goes along with the diagnostic process that helps physicians get to their ultimate conclusions. We're now going to take you into Toronto, Canada, St. Michael's Hospital, which is one of the best clinics in the world, and look to see how they arrive at the conclusions of how far along the given patient is in this medical process. process.
To date, there is no single reliable screening test for vibration exposure cases, but there are a number of tests which, when used together, help provide a more accurate picture of a worker's condition. This is a segment from a program produced by the Ministry of Labor of Ontario, Canada. It features the tests that are done in their clinic, overseen by Dr. Peter Pelmier. Following an initial examination, a sophisticated series of tests are administered in the ministry's lab by trained personnel. A function of the central nervous system can be assessed by the use of a vibrometer. This is used to establish the patient's threshold response and sensitivity to vibration. To get an assessment of the motor sensory response, an electrical stimulus is applied and the time of conduction is measured. The target points are from the finger to the wrist and from the wrist to the elbow, which makes this procedure also effective at discerning carpal tunnel syndrome. Next, the blood flow is checked in four stages. In order to evaluate the large arteries in the arm, pressure measurements are taken at different points in the arm using a Doppler. To obtain pressures in each of the digits, Velcro strips with an encased photocell are wrapped around each finger. A graph recorder registers the flow through all digits. The third test involves obtaining pressure measurements in a control and in a test finger simultaneously. Then, an alternating hot-cold water line running through the cuff on the target finger is used to measure blood pressure changes in relation to temperature changes. A cold water blanket may be worn by the patient to complete this procedure. Finally, the last test to evaluate the vascular severity may also produce the white finger blanching. The patient is wrapped in a warming blanket to keep the baseline constant. Each finger has a thermometer attached that feeds data back to a chart recorder. Then the hand is immersed in cold water. The small plastic balls help to keep the temperature at a constant 10 degrees Celsius. Readings are taken for a period of time while the hand is in the bath and after it is extracted. The result becomes easy to see. It's important to understand that in any disease process, there's a finite amount of time that takes before the disease kicks in. In this case, we call it latency, the latency to blanching. That is the time at which the tool operator starts working with a given tool to the appearance of the first white fingertip. This is called the latency to blanching. And we're going to listen to Dr. Cherniak once again describe that process to you. This is potentially a, uh, uh, a devastating consequence uh, for a person who in general is going to be at a fairly uh, early stage uh, in, their, uh, in their work career. Uh, again, it's uh, frequently in terms of a dedicated uh, pneumatic tool user, something on the interval of six to eight years after beginning employment. Thinking about people in their late 20s or early 30s, uh, this is potentially a disastrous uh, turn of events if, in fact, this will have a, uh, a negative effect on their current and future employment. Our final transition will be back to Dr. Cherniak discussing the potential medications that can be used in the treatment of HAVS. Unfortunately, there is no cure at this sitting. Hopefully someday there will be a cure, but at this point, Dr. Cherniak will discuss a classification of drugs called calcium channel blockers. And we're hoping for a cure someday, but at this point, it is strictly palliative. Uh, there are new categories of medications. Uh, primarily those which vasodilate, which uh, cause blood vessels to enlarge, uh, which can be fairly effective in controlling cold-related symptoms. Uh, the ones that are most widely used uh, are what are called calcium channel blockers, uh, which are frequently used in the treatment of uh, heart disease, uh, coronary artery disease, and also for blood pressure control. These also have the effect of, of dilating blood vessels peripherally, one of the disadvantages is that, is that they're not selective to the uh, arms and fingers. And so particularly in younger workers, the side effects may not be tolerable. There are other uh, potential pharmacologic routes uh, for the vascular, uh, uh, for vascular symptoms. Um, these uh, include um, 
uh, drugs which are called uh, alpha blockers, uh, although it turns out that the type of receptor which seems to be most affected in the hand arm vibration syndrome is not particularly uh, well addressed uh, by the current commercial medications, uh, which is to say there may be pharmacologic interventions uh, over the next several years which will be more selective uh, than the ones which are currently available. Uh, I should probably add at the same time uh, that uh, the, the opposite uh, uh, dimension is also true, uh, that there are a number of medications which are commonly used in medical practice, particularly in terms of, of uh, uh, coronary artery disease and blood pressure control, for example, the beta blockers, uh, which will tend to make this condition worse. When we shot this tape many years ago, there were very few mechanisms that we had for controlling HAV in the workplace. Today we are blessed with many more control mechanisms available now, and I'd like to briefly discuss them with you. The first is the tool itself. We now have a pipeline filling each day with new and better tools. They're called anti-vibration tools. These tools are designed to meet both national and international standards for hand arm vibration. The second area is full-fingered gloves. You need gloves, and especially what we call ISO 10819 certified full-fingered gloves, because the glove must do what the tool can't do. We're asking the glove to take out an additional amount of vibration, and please wear a pair of gloves, not one glove or another glove, but a full pair of gloves, despite the fact that some tools are operated with one hand. That said, we need full-fingered pair of gloves because HAVS always, always starts at the tips and works down towards the palm. If you purchase a glove, where the fingers are exposed, HAVS will occur, and the amount of protection given the worker is very, very minimal at best. Please use only full-fingered gloves. Get them fit properly, the way you would fit a good pair of shoes. Okay? That's most important. And understand, the gloves also have to keep your hands warm and dry, or else an attack will set in. Warm and dry is most important. Full-fingered gloves is an absolute necessity. Now, there are things you can do for yourself or things workers can do for themselves, and here are a few of them. The tighter you hold a tool, the more vibration gets into your hand. So if you let the tool do the work and hold it, with minimum grip strength, consistent with safe work practices. We don't want anybody getting hurt. On the other hand, there's no necessity to overly squeeze the tool and hold it rigidly. The second thing is, do not smoke. Nicotine, cold, vibration, all constrict the blood vessels of the fingers and the toes, and we don't want you to smoke for obvious reasons, okay? If signs and symptoms appear, please get help. Do not wait. Get help. And we thank you for your attention.